Hello and thank you for joining us today. My name is Maria Tuner and I'll be your host during this interview. Today we are talking to a very inspiring speaker who will answer questions regarding his life as an infectious disease scientist during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Judd F. Holtquist, Assistant Professor at Northwestern University in Chicago. Judd is here today to share how he became a scientist, what kind of research his lab does, and also to share his views of some of the challenges and opportunities that have come in the wake of this pandemic. I encourage you to not miss the end of the interview where he will share what he and his lab has learned from all of this and also give some great advice to future graduate students. So Jed, my first question is, what inspired you to become a scientist? Yeah, it's one of those tricky questions. Um, you know, I think the my very first exposure to research was uh, plant biology. I kind of grew up in northern Wisconsin, um, and you're in the middle of the woods, and you're close to nature, and it, you know, plants always kind of were my my number one. So as an undergrad, I did enough plant biology research, and while I was uh, researching corn, uh, you can imagine that Wisconsin has uh, plenty of corn research going on. <laughs> I made my first discovery, which we identified uh, um, a microRNA that was regulating differentiation of the flowers of the corn plant. Um, and it's it's unlike anything anything I've ever felt before, and it remains to this day kind of my my favorite high is that that high of discovery it's realizing when you when you found something um, and scientifically proven it to yourself and realize you know you're the first person in the world to, to have known that one particular fact no matter how small it is um it's just it's an incredible experience so i think that more than anything else really hooked me uh in the scientific endeavor so what took you from the, the high of corn flowers to COVID and was it also uh, HIV or Zika? Yeah, yeah so when I, uh, I decided to go for my PhD um, and determining what to study in graduate school was a difficult choice. Um, so as a gay man, choosing to work with infectious disease was important to me because it meant so much to my own community. Um, and especially at the time that this was happening, um, it, it meant a lot to me personally. My partner and I met when we were both in undergrad. And at that time, uh, it was in vogue in the United States for uh, conservative lawmakers to be passing these anti-marriage amendments. Uh, mm -hmm. forbidding the union between um, gay partnerships. So my partner and I actually had met at one of those events, uh, sort of protesting these anti-gay marriage amendments. Um, and then when we moved to Minnesota to do my graduate work, um, as soon as we moved there, one was proposed for that state and we ended up having to fight the fight all over again. So it was in this kind of background of, you know, fighting for our own civil liberties that I was trying to choose you know, what I wanted to study as a scientist. And you know, studying HIV was one way where I felt like I could really be giving back to, you know, this really supportive community that had given me so much. And it's really, you know, the more and more you learn about infectious disease in general, it truly is, is a history of opportunistic infection um, and, and inequality. Um, because the people who have the fewest resources to you know, protect themselves from a disease, be it HIV, flu, or now COVID, uh, they are the ones that end up suffering the most, uh, both in terms of raw numbers of people who get infected, but also in terms of consequences. Um, you know, it might not mean that much if I end up sitting out of work for a week with flu, um, but for somebody who absolutely needs that job, to support themselves and support their family day in day out, you know, a week's absence is is huge. What is surprising to me, and that I want to ask you, is why do you think that such a big part of the scientific community was surprised when COVID nineteen really took hold on 
you know, the entire world. Yeah. What happened and how can we avoid this happening again? There are all kinds of, of infectious diseases that jump from animals into humans, um, these so-called zoonotic infections. And people tend to think of them as these rare events, but they're actually happening you know, all the time. Just even within our own lives, we have you know, HIV as, as a prominent example, but then you have all of these other outbreaks such as SARS and MERS, other coronaviruses. We've had several different types of flu jump into the human population, including swine flu and, and bird flu. Um, but then there are also these other diseases such as Ebola, which, which has been causing these sporadic outbreaks in Africa. So the idea of a zoonotic infection taking hold in the population isn't something that's new. I think what really caught us all off guard was how rapidly this was able to spread. Because all of these other you know, infectious diseases, either they spread fairly slowly or it was not that severe of a disease. So for example, Ebola is very severe, but it doesn't spread very fast. Flu, while that's also no picnic, it's not as severe as um, Ebola or COVID-19. You know, COVID-19 really borders that line between fast transmission and severity where it becomes scary. If somebody can spread it when they're not showing symptoms, that's really when a virus becomes dangerous because mm -hmm. so many of our public health measures that we try to use to prevent viruses from spreading rely on us being able to tell that person is sick. And if we can't do that, we need to develop tests and then you get into this big testing argument that we've been watching play out. You and your team are currently studying um, coronavirus. What are your techniques that you're using? My lab really specializes in these high throughput, what are called omics approaches. And what these approaches are designed to do is to gather as much information about a given system at one time. And then we use computational approaches to try to understand what all of that data means. And so to help in the battle against coronavirus, what we really wanted to do was try to understand, you know, is this virus changing over time in the population? And does, do those viral changes have any impact on disease severity or treatment outcome? Now, it's fairly straightforward to get, your, to get access to large amounts of clinical data if you're working in the context of a hospital system. However, what we needed to pair with that was viral sequencing data. Um, and so to do that, we've been working with the hospital to get samples and then use next generation sequencing approaches to analyze the virus sequences in each of our patients. Yeah, I saw your, your results here um, the other day were out and it is super interesting to see how it spreads. So what is your next step in this research? You're looking to test more samples or include other test centers? Yeah, well, there are so many different directions that, that we want to take this research. You know, these initial findings were really focused on, you know, based on the sequences of the viruses in Chicago. Can we identify where these viruses came from? Um, and can we identify how many different types there might be circulating in the Chicago area? Once we identify those types, then we can look to see whether or not there are differences in disease severity, outcomes, um, the, their ability to be treated with various antivirals, you know, those kind of things. So that's what this initial report was really focused on. Now that we have kind of an idea of what viruses are circulating in the Chicago area, now we really want to track what happens to these over time. So part of what our research is now morphing into is tracking these infections in the population over time, but then also in individuals over time to see whether or not the virus is adapting to the population and adapting to individuals um, even within their own bodies. So have you heard about this um, in children, there is some uh, systemic inflammation disease linked to this virus. Is that is that something that the research field is taking seriously or is this a media hype? Obviously, whenever there are unexpected complications, especially in children, um, it's something that clinicians and, and scientists do look at. Yeah, you know, that's the last thing that we wanted to see. 
Um, but that being said, it is still uh, an exception as opposed to a rule. Um, in fact, a lot of times, many children don't present with symptoms at all. Um, and so trying to understand these differences in clinical outcome you know, is a major unknown that a lot of different groups, including our own, are beginning to try to dissect. You know, roughly 80%, it's estimated, of infections have no symptoms at all. And then a lot of uh, cases might be mild, well as a large number of them require hospitalizations. That's, why is that? It can't all be explained based on viral diversity. There has to be some difference within ourselves that can account for this. Um, and that applies both to adults as it does to children. And so trying to identify, you know, what's the predictor of disease severity in, in adults and in kids is, is really important. So how many samples are you trying to include in this? I know you have initially 88 samples that you did from your your hospital, right? So our, our ultimate goal is to sequence roughly a thousand different okay. viral genomes from a thousand distinct patients. Because with that number, we can really begin to ask more granular questions than we were able to ask with these first sort of subset. What do you think are the scientific challenges COVID-19 researchers are faced with right now? You know, I've been having this kind of discussion with my students of quite a bit because science typically moves at a certain fairly slow and regular pace. Um, and that pace is dictated by the fact that we want to be absolutely certain that everything that we publish and everything we do is is 100% fact. And so now we're faced with this difficult um, circumstance where the need to identify new information um, and test new hypotheses is so critical to our ability to combat this right now that we're faced with this dilemma between speeding up basically the science, but maybe not having the complete um, confidence in it that we would have otherwise. And so one thing that we're beginning to see in the scientific community become really popular, especially with COVID, are these pre-peer review publications. So I'm sure that um, you've seen a lot of articles come out that make news headlines in, in MedArchive or BioArchive, um, which are these repositories of manuscripts that people are working on um, that have not yet been evaluated by the broader scientific community. Mm -hmm. So it's a really important way to kind of share information, but it always comes with this caveat is how much of, can you trust that's on there? Because science takes a long time. It just, it, it just does. And so we want to move as fast as we can with as much confidence as, as we can. Normally, we are careful to, especially when working with infectious diseases, you try to make sure that there are multiple people around at the same time so that you can supervise them. You try to minimize the number of hours someone has to work consecutively. Um, and then for training, that's a lot of one-on-one -on -one time and supervision that needs to occur for someone to get properly trained in working with these infectious agents. And now all of those practices go immediately against what we're trying to accomplish with social distancing. Mm -hmm. And so also trying to adapt how we train scientific personnel, how we conduct our experiments safely, but now also taking into account, you know, the need for social distancing has been challenging. So do you find that it has kind of forced you to reevaluate your practices and trying to automate things that can be automated or streamline things or weed out stuff that was fluff perhaps? Do you think your lab is more efficient after this? Is there a silver lining? I think there are definitely some places where it's more efficient. Um, I think it's also benefited from the fact that, you know, everybody who's working and working in the lab now is dedicated to finding some solution to this horrific problem. And so you know, coming into the lab and seeing all of these you know, researchers really giving it their all and um, putting their, their lives on the line in order to get this research done is, is really inspiring. And so I think that's another really sort of bright line aspect is you get to work as part of this you know, dedicated community that it's inspirational. Yeah, I would think that it's exciting at the same time. This is groundbreaking 
the whole world is waiting for answers and as soon as there's something out the media will jump on it i have a last question what are some of the best tips and advice that you would tell new grad students entering academia my recommendation for them would probably be to be nice to yourself be your your own best friend you have to advocate for yourself and you have to be generous with yourself and you have to be forgiving of yourself i've seen scientists be successful in so many different ways but everybody that i've seen be a successful scientist has been willing to to treat themselves with the respect that they would treat anyone else it's really easy when you come into lab and your experiments are all failing everything takes forever to really kind of get down on yourself or to measure yourself to other people or other labs but there's so many ways to contribute to to the scientific enterprise that you have to identify your strength and then um, move that forward that's a really inspirational and optimistic way of viewing scientific life. I know there's a lot of self-doubt and you're failing experiments and then your lab mate is just, uh, you know, pumping out publications. It can be really hard probably. But I guess also what COVID-19 has shown us is collaborating, like just share with the world what your findings are. Um, don't sit in your little corner and hide all your research because we get way further if we share and communicate. Absolutely, amen to that. Amen. So I have a I have a question and it's just curiosity for the stem cell products. Mm -hmm. If you are using any of the stem cell products, are there any that you're using on a daily basis? Yeah. I, I, so I use um, their various positive and negative selection kits quite frequently, um, particularly to isolate out CD4 positive cells, uh, resting memory cells. We do CD3 sometimes. I actually have FICOL centrifugations going on right now, so I'm going to be using <laughs> them in an hour. So we do a lot of functional genomic work in human blood. Mm -hmm. So we'll um, isolate CD4 positive T cells out of blood, and then we'll use CRISPR-Cas9 ribonucleoproteins and electroprate them in, and then we'll take those T cells that have been modified and challenge them with HIV. And then we can monitor HIV infection in these cultures over time, see how different genetic alterations change the replication profiles. And that is so cool. That so yeah, is that's exciting. what we use the stem cell kits for, is we need to isolate those cells out. I love the stem cell stuff because it was, I was using, as a grad student, I used Milteni's damn columns, and I just, I hated them so much. <laughs> that's good to hear. Yeah. So much better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, we're... We're working hard to make sure that, you know, we have products that works and we never over promise. Thank you so much for your time, Jared, and, and uh, enjoy your research and uh, this crazy time. It was great to meet you. Thank you. Bye.